Thank you very much for having us today. Um, can you guys hear me okay? All right, great. And again, thank you very much for having us today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Karin Wadzak and I'm a program manager at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And um, as this conference was getting put together, we had the chance to coordinate with Myani and tee up this session for the end of the agenda here. And we are very, very grateful for the opportunity to feature a project that we all have been working on tell you a little bit about it, and then to hear from all of you about your priorities for solar development and some of the challenges you might be experiencing and the um, solutions that you have found in your own experiences working toward solar development on tribal land. I have the pleasure of working um, with a team at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the Midwest Tribal Energy Resources Association, as well as Renewable Northwest on this project, which is addressing regulatory barriers to tribal solar deployment. And this is a project that's three years long. We're about halfway through it, and it's funded by the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office, which, as you heard just 15 minutes ago when Pilar was giving her um, seatbelt necessary presentation, um, has a great interest in fostering tribal solar deployment, and they funded this project um, that is a partnership between um, Terra the National Lab and Renewable Northwest in order to be able to reduce some of those regulatory barriers and move tribal solar forward at any scale. Um, oops. Our team, as mentioned, is a large group between the Midwest Tribal Energy Resources Association, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and Renewable Northwest. And you're going to hear today from Jake MJ and Ruben, who are th three of our key players on the team. And what, what we're doing is working together to, um, through the things that we hear from our working group of tribal staff and leaders, state regulators and their staff, electric utility representatives, industry representatives, and members of the energy advocacy community, to identify what the policy roadblocks or challenges are that are delaying or preventing tribal solar deployment at the rooftop scale, facility scale, or utility scale. And then to bring those parties together to either find solutions that have worked and replicate them in other places, or to develop potential new ideas for policy solutions. And of course, the side benefit of having this diverse stakeholder working group is to build stronger relationships among the different parties. So those are the goals of the project. And what we're actually, the things we're actually doing and how we're actually doing them are the details I'm gonna share here. Um, at the beginning, middle and end of the project, we have had questionnaires to find out what people's priorities are, what people's level of interest or engagement are in the topics, the different policy topics or in solar development on tribal land. Um, and it help us focus our efforts and our work in areas that'll be most effective or of most interest to our primarily tribal audience. Um, as many of your work has been over the last year and a half, our project has gone from an expectation of meeting together in person to pivoting to a virtual environment. And so our working group has been meeting through conference calls and webinars and workshops and listening sessions and one-on-one -on -one conversations um, on the phone or on video call. And we've been able to have stakeholder participation in those virtual environments. And we sincerely hope that next summer um, we'll be able to have in-person, next spring, summer, fall, we'll be able to have in-person events in different regions around the country. This project is intended to be accessible to any tribe um, anywhere in the United States, as long as there's an interest in solar deployment and the um, Midwest Tribal Energy Resources Association um, as a project partner has then managed to work well outside of their geographic boundary to collaborate with tribes across the whole country. We held listening sessions. Um, we had several last November, this January, February, April, um, July, 
and uh, September. And we actually just had a different conference workshop yesterday at a different conference. And the point of the rest of this session is to hold a listening session with all of you about solar deployment and your own experiences. And those events are specifically designed for us to hear from um, the stakeholders involved in this project and to vet the ideas that we're hearing and to bring different parties together to hear each other's perspectives and to work together on those solutions. So that's listening sessions or webinars or workshops and things of that nature. And then ultimately we have drafted and are in the process of putting together a set of guidebooks and different media training materials to make the information that we're gathering accessible in a number of different ways to different parties once we have wrapped this project up and have gone you know, along our way. And um, to that point, MTERA is going to be hosting all those materials on their website and using them going forward in their training activities and other organizational activities. And we're also working with other um, organizations and groups that are interested in using materials for different purposes. And anybody is welcome to use those or host those as well. Um, with what you've heard right now, you may be wondering how you can get involved in this project. We have a project platform and I will, once I'm off, I will drop this link that's on the screen here also into the chat. And um, through this the online working group platform, you can schedule one-on-one -on -one conversation with us or get involved in the forum online um, and find out more about what we've been doing and what our plans are for the future. And over the course of the winter, we'll be doing virtual events and hopefully we'll have a chance to potentially meet some of you all in person in the spring or summer of next year. Thank you, Jake, he put it in the chat. Um, and then with that, uh, I just want to give a high level overview of what this project is. And I will hand things off to Jake Glavin, who is the executive director of the Midwest Tribal Energy Resources Association. And as such, she plays a very um, large role in the MTERA collaboration on this project. Thank you very much. Hello everyone and thank you Karin, thank you Mayani. This has been a wonderful event and I'm honored to be a part of it. As Karin mentioned, I have the honor of serving as the executive director for MTERA, the Midwest Tribal Energy Resources Association. We are an intertribal nonprofit 501c3 organization and we serve member tribes in Minnesota, Wisconsin and Michigan. Our mission is to empower our member tribes to manage their energy resources. And we do that through collective action. So we kind of have a three-pronged approach. The first is focusing on the network. The second is providing direct services to our members. And the third is pursuing collective action projects. And this NREL Tribal Solar Initiative is one of those. But I don't want to take up too much time here. I want to really pass the mic to MJ Anderson and Ruben Martinez, who have been the all-stars putting together a lot of these case studies. But I do think what we have going with the network piece of MTERA is really special. And just seeing the event this week here, I, I think it's something we absolutely want to continue the conversation with you all about how we connect. Because what we're really doing is we are bringing the tribal energy champions from each of our member tribes into a discussion. And we are talking about what has worked, what hasn't worked, sharing those lessons learned. I think if there's kind of one value proposition for what we're doing, it's that there is a fire hose of opportunities, challenges, projects, information. Anytime I see a presentation from Pilar, I feel that fire hose and I get excited about it. We are just trying to convert that fire hose into a water fountain that is easier for our tribal energy champions to digest and, and really take what's out there and apply it to their member tribes. And kind of the last analogy I like to bring up is that we also like to try to convert that water to beer or wine or coffee or Kool-Aid, whatever your drink of choice is, because we want to make it fun. We have passionate energy, tribal energy champions where if you don't have the time or the resources or the organizations out there, it can be stressful. And we just want to make it fun and easier to digest. Uh, and with that, I want to kind of pass it to MJ and Ruben here. They have been doing a ton of great work on this tribal solar initiative. Uh, MJ Anderson, she is an intern with MTERA. She's 
leading kind of the program management of the Tribal Solar Initiative on behalf of MTERA. She is a Bad River Band tribal member. Ruben Martinez is with the Macaw Tribe. Uh, he is also an intern with Renewable New Northwest who we've partnered with on this project. And they are gonna present two case studies that we've gathered as part of this project. Again, with the focus on what has worked, what hasn't worked, what are some solutions, how do we share that information? With that, thank you everyone. And I will pass it to MJ, I believe you're first up, or is it Ruben? I got it. You got it, MJ. Good afternoon, everyone. I think I have some slides. Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be sharing them. We did send them in. We're sharing them? Okay, perfect. Okay, hopefully everyone can see it. All right, we're good to go. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is MJ Anderson and I work for the Midwest Tribal Energy Resources Association. Um, I'm like Jake said, I'm from the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, um, Meshkazibi, for those of you who know the area. And I'll be presenting just one of the case studies that are helping us to identify those regulatory barriers. Um, at the top, I also want to apologize ahead of time because I am living in a multi generational home. So there are some gremlins who are home from school already and other people running around. I've asked them to hold it together for 10 minutes, but we'll see how it goes. So. <laughs> Uh, today I'll be presenting the case study from Leech Lake. Uh, when we were gathering the case studies for this project, we were obviously trying to get the most complete picture that we can to identify the barriers that may exist out there. So we've been looking at case studies all across the US uh, of all different sizes. And this case study is a little smaller, 200 kilowatts and relatively recent. But um, I think there's a lot of value and things that everyone can learn, especially when we're talking about community solar. So this project was ultimately successful and completed in 2019. Thanks a lot to um, the project implementation team's quick thinking and adaptability. So uh, this project started in 2015 when Leech Lake received grant funding from the Department of Energy for a 200 kilowatt solar field. And this project was just one part of Leech Lake's overarching sustainability plan and goals, uh, which all together really allow Leech Lake to enhance their tribal sovereignty and to decrease their reliance on fossil fuels. Um, and these energy projects, as well as other projects that they engage in are all really going to the ultimate goal of improving and benefiting their communities. So, um, the plan for this project was that the compensation funds from this uh, solar field would feed into the tribe's low income home energy assistance program. Uh, and actually this would be the first solar field of its kind in the US that would give access to low income communities to renewable energy. So this was a big step in um, you know, solar accessibility. Okay, let's see if we can, there we go. Uh, I know everybody here is most likely in New Mexico. So for those of you less familiar with Leech Lake, I've provided some maps for some context. So on the left-hand side, you can see Leech Lake is located in North Central Minnesota. It's circled in red. Gets pretty cold here in the winters. And um, then on the right-hand side, there's a more detailed map with the reservation overlaid with the utility service areas. Um, I think many people, most of us know that many tribes are rurally located, so they are served by rural uh, co-ops and also many are served by more than one utility. Leech Lake is a extreme example. Um, you know, they have five utilities that service them. Three of them are co-ops and two are investor owned. Uh, and, you know, there's not really anything to be done about that, especially in the near term, but maintaining and establishing relationships with five different entities can definitely <laughs> be time consuming and difficult. Um, and then taking that a step further and building tribal representation or tribal liaisons in those governing boards is also an uphill battle. So that just adds like another layer of complication when you're, or complexity, when you're looking at doing a project like this community-wide. So uh, when this project was started, there was some negotiations that went on about a year long and um, the utility, the utility the utility board that they were working with ultimately told the implementation team that this project would only really be worthwhile for them if they owned it. 
um, and offered the tribe the avoided cost rate. Uh, so the implementation team decided to pivot. Uh, as many of you know, this rate would be too low to really be economically viable for the tribe or for them to really achieve the goals that they had set out to achieve with this project. So instead, the team started investigating into the state's net metering cap policies. Uh, Minnesota has a 40 kilowatt net metering cap, which is one of the strictest in the US. Um, and so instead decided to install five separate utility, 40 kilowatt solar gardens across the reservation. So two of them are with Beltrami Electric. One is with North Itasca, one is with Lake Country Power, and the last is actually off reservation with one of the partner projects, Rural Renewable Energy Alliance, at their solar headquarters. Here we go. Um, but ultimately, this project was successful. So like I said, it was completed in 2019, and now it generates 235 megawatts per year, about. And as Leech Lake receives nine cents per megawatt from the utilities, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program is able to receive an additional twenty-two dollars to $25,000 per year, uh, which helps an additional 100 families um, receive assistance to afford their electric costs every year. Um, of course, there's not ever a good time to be without electricity, especially in today's modern world. It's never just or right, but up here in the Midwest, it gets very, very cold in the winter. So. You know, it can be very dangerous in the summer for, or in the winter, sorry, in the winter for people to be without power. So this is a huge step in Leech Lake paving the way as leaders in sustainability, but also in the just energy transition. So when we were speaking to the project leaders of this project, we came to a few conclusions about what the lessons learned were and some things that other people might find useful when starting their own projects like this. Um, so first and foremost, and I think this applies to really anything you do, communication is super important. Um, having that effective and early communication within your community and also with your project implementation team and also with your utility is vital to a smooth project. Um, having those frank discussions about your project goals and you know what you need or want to get done with a project can really uh, help you to avoid drawn out negotiation, negotiations and back and forth that kind of wastes time and doesn't really serve anybody. Additionally, and this is more of a long-term solution, building up that tribal capacity and expertise in uh, these areas can really help for providing you with a knowledgeable and self-sustaining community. Um, if it's important for your community to be enhancing your energy sovereignty, uh, having that energy champion like Jake talked about before, uh, with the expertise necessary uh, to lead these projects is key. Um, we all know that the energy industry is complex, dynamic, and it, you know, rules change all the time. So being aware of everything is not possible. <laughs> at least it's not possible for me. So, you know, but having somebody on your team that at least has the background and some knowledge about it is super helpful when implementing a project or even having somebody who can advocate for you. And then lastly, and this ties into having that background knowledge, um, understanding the utility service areas and knowing what policies and regulations, federally, locally, and like state regulations is super important because that can mean, um, you know, the difference between a failed project or a successful implementation, especially when you're considering a project like this one that resulted in a team that had to be quick on their feet and flexible at the last minute. So. Uh, like I said, it was a success, and I hope that this was informational for you, and I will hand it off to Ruben Martinez. Thank you, everyone. How I... <laughs> Sweet. Thanks, MJ. Um, okay, let me get my stuff going here. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So hello, everybody. Um, like Jake and MJ have uh, graciously announced, uh, my name is Ruben Martinez, and I uh, belong to the Macaw Nation. I work for Renewable Northwest as their tribal liaison. Renewable Northwest is a renewable clean energy advocacy organization based out of uh, Portland, Oregon. And you know we're a partner on this uh, Travel Solar Initiative project. I live here um, in the Pacific Northwest, specifically in Bellingham. 
Uh, so I thought it would be interesting to kind of talk about this region and how that affects tribes in this energy space. And also to take a, a dive into the uh, a case study that we did on the Spokane tribe's journey into renewable energy and what their challenges were around implementing solar on tribal lands. Okay, so let's take a, a minute to talk a little bit about the energy climate in the Pacific Northwest. For those who don't know, the Pacific Northwest is served by BPA, Bonneville Power Administration. BPA is a federal agency who is the biggest distributor of hydro in the region. They also own a large amount of transmission in the region. That's kind of why they were set up to bring power to uh, uh, rural areas. Um, so it's, it's important to mention that BPA is not the only service provider in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there are plenty of investor owned utilities or, or IOUs um, and that we can see here on our, our little map here. Um, the Spokane tribe, uh, who we're gonna get to here in a minute, they're, they're served by an IOU called Avista. Um, I mention all of this because the Pacific Northwest does not have an ISO or an independent system operator or an RTO and BPA is the closest thing we have, even though that it's, it's very unique in its, its structure. Um, but the Pacific Northwest has an overwhelming amount of hydro generation. As we can see here on the left, um, we are 57% powered by hydro. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> and um, because of all of the uh, hydro generation, um, the energy here is very cheap due to systems that are largely paid off. And, um, this doesn't necessarily consider the loss of economic opportunities for tribal people or the loss of cultural sites or habitats. Um, as, a, as a quick example, the, the salmon here are at historic lows. They're at 2% of what we were pre-contact. And I mean, that's a complicated issue in itself, but I, I guess it's um, uh, to mention. Um, so now we're gonna jump into the, the COSY project or the Children of the Sun initiative. Um, this is the Spokane Tribes uh, solar project. So the Spokane Tribes started this project in part to adapt to one of the effects of climate change. In the last 10 years, Washington State has lost an average of 460,000 acres a year due to wildfires. These wildfires are what sparked the Spokane Tribes resolve to really commit to COSY because they were cut off from their electric grid when the 2016 Cayuse fire burned through their power lines, which prevented them from being able to operate their hoses to fight the fires. The devastating loss was what kicked off a $2.1 million project. A total of 650 kilowatts of solar capacity were installed across 25 government buildings. The policy barriers that the Spokane case study were focused around uh, were tax credits and the net metering rules around Washington state. So I know Pilar um, just a little while ago kind of uh, touched into tax credits, but we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it again. Um, so tax credits, uh, for those who don't know what the ITC is, it's the uh, federal tax credit. Um, it's a reduction in income taxes uh, that the taxable entity investing in a solar project would pay to the federal government. The ITC is based on the amount invested in the solar project. This allows the taxable entity to use this credit to pay for the project rather than the taxes. Um, because tribal governments own solar projects are not eligible to receive the ITC, the first year costs of a solar project will be functionally higher than those of a taxable entity. So I guess the most important thing to kind of take away from the ITC is that tribes, uh, we can't collect them on our own. Um, and this is because we don't pay federal or state taxes. And even if a tribal business does pay taxes, you know, to state or, or federal, or whatever, they typically don't have the tax appetite to capture the full value of this ITC, um, you know, because it's in, in the millions sometimes. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a lot. <laughs> um, therefore, uh, many times tribes or tribal enterprises partner with these third party taxable entities, which is what the Spokane tribe did. And it's a very common thread through a lot of successful solar projects that we've seen on, on tribal land. Um, the second uh, barrier is the net metering. So everywhere has different net metering um, policies. And for here in Washington, 
um, we have a cap of uh, 100 kilowatts per project or for each project. And just to clarify for this, it's not like in total. So like the, um, like I said, the Spokane tribe, we had a 650 kilowatt project, but that's, um, we're kind of looking at each plate on, on each project house or, or wherever they were putting it or building. Um, so as long as like these plates uh, were, were under uh, that 100 kilowatt per, I guess, uh, building that they were trying to, to put these on, then that was okay. Um, cause otherwise I guess what would be the point. Um, so unless a tribe is, is doing these projects in the Pacific Northwest, um, with the idea of sovereignty and self-reliance as the primary motive, using renewable energy projects as a financial or economic investment is extremely difficult to pencil out, uh, largely in part due to the, to our region's extremely cheap hydro energy. So if tribes are going to invest in these renewable energy projects, it's really helpful to find a way to value resilience at the forefront of these projects. And if these are addressed, perhaps more projects of these scope could be implemented. In fact, I know that Spokane is planning to add energy storage in their solar projects uh, going forward um, to provide this resiliency and that um, they're still kind of, you know, in, in talks with Avista to try to figure out how to do these things. But um, as I last mentioned, um, as the Renewable Northwest's uh, travel liaison, I have reached out to all 51 tribes in the Pacific Northwest, and I have about 24 contacts from these tribes. And every tribe I spoke to has interest in renewable energy. And or I should say, but, but for tribes in the Pacific Northwest, among the many things that they're gonna to have to think about for a successful renewable energy project, their state's net metering and how they can work around these ITCs are two big questions that I think are worth thinking about. Um, with that, uh, Klecko Klecko, which is in my language, thank you, 